Hello. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Postrails webinars. Yes. So, and I'm so excited. I met Varun, you know, today's guest. I met Varun, I think maybe five, six years ago or before that, uh, once when I, I was in my starting days and I uh, met him in Tadawa, if I'm not wrong, and uh, met him along with a couple of his friends. And I remember approaching him and talking to him. And I was really scared to talk to him. And I even <laughs> told him that. <laughs> that I'm so, I'm so happy to see this guy because, you know, when uh, through social media, I used to follow all these people and seeing them in real and talking to them was such a pleasure. And there was the best part was there was absolutely no attitude. And he was so happy to share his experience. It was a small talk, but then, yeah, it was a very, very great, uh, you know, conversation among between us. Uh, even if, even though it was for a shorter time, uh, so it's 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 not that often you come across people without much attitude in uh, in the wildlife photography. So yeah. that day I was really happy to see him, and I'm a big fan of his work. And I'm really happy that he accept our uh, request and uh, without any drama and, and come on, uh, you know, agree to be with us and to share his experience over here. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Varun was born and brought up in Nagpur, and he started his photography journey back in 2007. Since there those like there was no looking back for him he always tried to go to these jungles and he have covered almost all the national parks in india and he have traveled to the african uh, continents as well to capture the wildlife of africa and he he is more into uh, photographing tigers i uh, i read that he have photographed more than 300 tigers from uh, Indian uh, forest. And uh, he is one of the contributors of uh, the social media pages for Discovery Channel as well. And his images has been taken by government and non-governmental non -government, non agencies in India and outside as well. So let's welcome uh, the great wildlife photographer, Varun Thakkar. Hello, Arun. Welcome. Hi, hi, MS. Hi, Nisha. Thank you so much hi. for having me. Thank you for coming and joining Thank us. You. You. <laughs> it's a pleasure to you know catch up with you again. And thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Nisha. Yeah. Let's let's begin with the self introduction about yourself. So, guys, uh, my name is uh, Varun Thakkar, and uh, I've been into wildlife photography since uh, last thirteen years. It's been a crazy journey, and you know, uh, this uh, this started as a hobby. <clears throat> this started as a hobby, but you know, while for wildlife photography it turns into an addiction soon. Once you shoot a wild tiger, it, as we all know, what tigers are, what majestic animals they are. So, photographing tigers turned this thing into an addiction, and it's a very good addiction, I should say. <laughs> So good to be addicted to such things. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, I'll be starting off with the slideshow so now. And uh, I'd like to give a short brief about uh, what kind of images I'm going to show you guys. So I'll be starting off with uh, one of my favorite subjects, uh, the elephants. Okay. I've been uh, shooting elephants in... Uh, Mostly in uh, Uttarakhand, uh, Corbett and uh, around Corbett, areas around Corbett, which I believe is uh, one of the best landscapes in India to photograph elephants. So yeah. uh, I've been photographing elephants uh, since 2012, I suppose, eight years now. And uh, then we'll come to one of my favorite subjects, uh, tigers. So I'll be telling uh, telling you about uh, some different perspectives, which I think, according to me, uh, stand out from others. I'll explain it to you why. So okay. then we'll come to tigers, photographing tigers uh, in uh, 
different perspective, different habitats, different parks, and, uh, and the different conditions, the shooting conditions, of course. So. Yeah. And uh, then I'll show you some images uh, which shows the wild animals in their habitats, in their escapes. Even which I think is a you know a different point of view, a different perspective, which actually matters in my life, and yeah, that is definitely. the only thing which I believe that matters. Yeah. Correct. So I'll be I'll be sharing a few of those images. Then I'll share yeah. some images from Africa. Okay. And a few from the Himalayas, the Western Himalayas and the Eastern Himalayas. Great. Right. So I think uh, we should get started with it. Yeah. Thanks. We have a lot of people saying hi. Khaldun, Cynthia, Saurabh, Koral Patel, Tanya Tiwari. Tanya is my wife. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I hope you guys are able to see my images. Yes, in this video. yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, this image is actually very, very, very special. And a pretty pretty rare moment, I would say. Uh, this is from uh, Dikala, Corbett, Uttarakhand. Mm -hmm. And this happens uh, at the start of the summers. I have made this image in April. And basically, this behavior was unheard of. Like even uh, the legends, the gurus like uh, Rajesh Bedi, Naresh Bedi, and uh, our late Nanak Chanding Rading Rangpu. When they saw this image, even uh, their reaction was like we are into wildlife uh, since 1980 80s 85 90s but we have never seen such a moment like a <laughs> elephant is swimming across the stream yeah and the fishes were literally jumping all over the elephant mm. like it took time for me to reach that place but still I, I was able to capture this moment where a fish was seen uh, flying right uh, above the elephant so this was Uttarakhand. okay and this image of an elephant, this basically marks the summer, the arrival of summer in Corbett. As you can see the dry grass in the background, and then the green leaves and the yellow trees. So basically these trees, uh, they will be fruiting or the leaves would be there till May end or uh, mid-May, I suppose. So when the uh, grasses in the background gets dry, that starts the mark of the summer in the Himalayan foothills. So basically this image uh, shows that the elephants in search of green grass, they find the uh, fruiting tree, the fruiting trees in summer. And from, from a uh, long, you know, long range of uh, the, uh, the grassland, Actually, they can smell the trees from a distance and they start uh, grazing down there. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can see this elephant down the tree. He is uh, feeding on the fruits that uh, fall from the tree. And yeah, so <clears throat> this this is one uh, uh, pretty different kind of image, I can say. I have made this image on 11 uh, mm. But this is not a camera trap. I have a uh, short. Mm. Yes, 11 mm. I have <laughs> shot it handled. So basically, you know what happens, Nisha Harmes here is a. Uh, it is very, very important for us to understand the behavior of an animal. And this is where uh, it works. We followed yeah. this uh, tusker for three, four days. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made him comfortable of our presence. He was not scared of us. He was not aggressive. And even we were not disturbing him. So this was the fifth fifth day, I suppose, fifth day evening. When we approached the elephant, he let us come close to him. Because he knew that we are not harming him. And of course, we were observing his behavior. He was calm and composed. And he let us stand uh, pretty close to him. Oh. And he came really close to me. And like you can imagine shooting something on 11mm is uh, how wide it would be. And this is on a full frame body. So you can just imagine how close it would be. So he just came <laughs> close to us and <laughs> walked beside us and did nothing, literally nothing. Of course, I so was you, scared. But yeah. you, you were walking or you were in a vehicle? I was in a vehicle. I was okay. in a vehicle. I was in a gypsy. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. So basically, you know, if you... Sorry. sorry yeah. This was captured in uh, Corbett. 
Corbett. Yes, this was okay. Corbett. Okay. Yeah. So basically, uh, this is what matters in wildlife: understanding the behavior, the making the animal comfortable of your presence. So yeah. this is what you can get. Then this is Dikala. <clears throat> this was, I suppose, uh, 2016. So basically, this calf is running after the mother mm. for milk. Because this is peak summers. After grazing the whole day, the calf, uh, calf is, of course, hungry. So he's not able to cope up with the speed of his uh, mother. So he's uh, holding her tail and trying to stop her. Like, wait, I want to. I wanna have food. So that's it. and this this image was awarded in Russia in 2016, and uh, published in many many international publications. Mm -hmm. I think this image has uh, three awards. Three uh, out of his two are international, and one international. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then this is also Dikala. Uh, this is peak winters January, when the grasslands are so misty that you are not even able you can't even see 20 meters ahead of your vehicle like and finding an elephant in such a mist is a, a big task so even if you find some elephant tigers or whatever it is very difficult uh, to focus in such a mist you know hmm. so my intention was to find an elephant against the light in the morning mm -hmm. with mist so this is what I could get in eight days, only one elephant. <laughs> so I was still satisfied with it. Like, yeah. That one is definitely amazing. Yeah, that's what you know. Patience is what matters in my life. So I had to make two, three trips for uh, for this kind of image and got it last to last year, I suppose, 2019, yeah, last year. So 16, 17, 18, three years I went there for elephants in January, but uh, was never lucky with them. So at least three, four years of it, one satisfactory image. Yeah, so this image basically shows how vast the grasslands are, how vast the mountains are, and how small are we. If you can see closely, there are about 20 to 30 huge elephants in this image, which actually look like ants. So these are the grasslands of Dikala, Corbett Tiger Reserve. And uh, you can see the elephants crossing through the dry stream, the dry river. So this is how vast, this is how huge the grasslands are. So this even uh, this image gives a different perspective uh, uh, to the uh, habitat of uh, Dikala. And of course, this image. Uh, <coughs> Even this is, of course, the color. These are the, these are the actual colors which you can see through your naked eye. I have, of course, enhanced the colors to uh, just to present in a much better way. So, but these are the actual colors of, uh, visible through your naked eye. So you can see the tricolor uh, of India, yeah. orange, blue, yeah. green. So, believe me, these are the colors which you can see. And this image. Uh, was uh, bought from me by the Indian Embassy in Singapore in 2014. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so this image uh, is, might be still hanging that it was there in 14, 15, and 16. I don't have any idea about that right now. It's so a beautiful one. This, yeah. <laughs> so even this is Dikala. Again, <clears throat> Corbett. Even this image uh, won me about four awards, three, three awards, I'm sorry, three awards. So this image basically shows two huge tuskers uh, just after the fight. They fought right in center of this river. And we had plans, we wanted to see tuskers because this was summer of 2014. So that was the last time when there were so many elephants in Tikala. As good as the uh, you know the African savanna, the African uh, landscapes, it was like three hundred to four hundred elephants and more than four or five hundred deers in the meadows. That was an unbelievable scene. That was hard to believe that we are in India and this is Uttarakhand. This is Dikala. So we were there for uh, quite a good time, and we had in mind about this image. We knew that summers uh, the male tuskers 
uh, are on must they are on heat they want to mate so they are super aggressive in summers so you know this is where the animal behavior comes into play again so you should understand you should know what kind of behavior uh, the animal uh, is into uh, or in which mood so we knew that the tuskers they are going to fight we are surely going to see some fights and we wanted it to be against light possibly in a river and we were quite lucky enough this was after 8 8 to 9 days of wait like we knew the tuskers are going around the river and we will get the shot so you know this basically shows uh, a typical habitat of corbett tiger reserve the ramganga river flowing through the elephants in it the tall dry dead trees and the mountains in the backdrop so this is what basically dikala is all about and corbett tiger reserve is all about and again <coughs> the magical mornings of uh, malen foothills so basically i uh, i like to tell something about this image in the background if you can see that looks like mist the winter mist right but yes. this image yeah so this image was made in april 2016 and the mist kind of thing you can see in the backdrop is actually the smoke in april 2016 the whole uttarakhand was burning all the forests of uttarakhand were burning and it's uh, a huge part of corbett tiger reserve was burned so this is actually the smoke so i made use of the smoke and i made it look like fog so many many people ask me like this is peak winters we know like how did you get sir, such such dry trees and dry branches in winter so basically this is not winter this was april and i made use of that smoke to look like fog and shot this under exposed this image and uh, got this feel of that, uh, right. that you know, tunnel type of feel yeah so this is again dikala corbett tiger reserve Now, this is a much wide perspective of what you saw the two elephants uh, fighting together but this shows you the again the dry river bed the trees and the mountains and the scape of uh, dikala so this is again corbett tiger reserve <clears throat> and uh, that's a black stock this was on a winter morning so see the perspective where i was talking about i had many photographers around me this time all with 500 mm 600 mm lenses so i thought like shooting something which everyone is doing why shouldn't i try something different so this is where your wide angle matters like choosing the right location to shoot right lens at the right time so that's why i decided to make a wide angle of it which shows a black stock entering the river in the typical uh, corbett habitat Uh, so uh, those images were from Corbett, uh, especially the elephants at the stock. So I just wanted to show you a perspective of uh, what my mindset or what point of view I carry with me when I'm in Corbett, or what I want to shoot there, and you know what's my thought process behind the images. So I'll be starting off with uh, some tiger images now. So should we take the questions right now or after the session? after uh, we are uh, we are, we can take it after the session and if there is any specific question we will definitely give you a shout out all right all right so uh, basically starting here with tigers so, like i told you i've been shooting wildlife uh, photographing wildlife since 13 years and uh, i photograph more than 300 tigers till day so whenever i see a tiger i of course uh, excited to see one but now what i think is like photographing tigers from so many years uh, what i think or my thinking has been developed in a way that i want a picture in a different perspective now because even we know uh, the number of photographers are increasing day by day so you need to stand out in uh, that crowd you know yeah so uh, yeah so uh, i'll show you some images uh, with some different perspective which for me are different and i'm sure many of us will find it useful okay. so again this is uh, starting off with corbett some uh, unlikely images from corbett 
So this was a tigress that was crossing the stream. So I thought of making a wide angle. This is uh, from a 50 mm lens, 50 mm 1.8. So again, this shows the uh, uh, typical uh, summer habitat in uh, Uttarakhand, Corbett. So the Ram Ganga River with the it is actually not kind of blue right now, but during the mornings when you see the water, it is actually sky blue. The whole running water, if it doesn't rain in the hills, you'll see the sky blue water. It is amazing, like undescribable thing. So even this is a wide angle perspective of a Thai restaurant. And again, the same thing. See, when you don't get a good background, I've seen it many times. When you don't get a good background, people... They prefer not to shoot and they just sit quietly and wait for the tiger to move around. Like why to waste time? You create your own visions. You have your naked eyes. You can create your frames with your naked eyes right there, right now. So the presence of mind is what matters. Okay. Now, for example, this tigress, <clears throat> she was sitting at the edge of the grassland, right? If you can see in the background, there are lantana grass and uh, the tall trees were there, sal trees. So it was obvious that I'm not going to get a good background for the tigress, but I can make a good foreground. That is my option. That is my perspective. Only thing is I need to see it that way. So what I did is I shot a vertical frame with my focus point at the top. I'm blurring the foreground just to give a different perspective, a different look to the image. You know, it adds to the image and it does not make it look flat. Yep. So that is why uh, your presence of mind and your point of view both matters at the same time. Right. And this image, yeah. So this is also one of my favorite from Tagoba. I got start, I started my wildlife from Tagoba. So I'll tell you why this is very close to me because this actually shows a typical habitat of Tagoba. This actually shows what Tagoba is all about. This shows a typical bamboo uh, canopy and a tiger walking around. Most of the tigers in Taroba, they prefer, uh, uh, like, they prefer what they, uh, Taroba is a bamboo forest, bamboo and a teak forest, a sal forest. So the tigers mostly they prefer bamboo because uh, bamboo is pretty cold. And as we know, that Taroba is, uh, is a very, very hot place. In summer, the temperature could go up to 47, 48 degrees or net time, 49 degrees Celsius. So basically, this image is very close to me because this shows your shows the typical Tarawa habitat. And then talk about uh, the, uh, we'll talk about the tight frames. <clears throat> I'll just explain the tight frames uh, with my perspective in two three images. So basically, we'll talk. We are talking about portraits here. So this is a tigress which is walking into the frame, right? If I had an option, I could have shot her uh, like so called, you know, the head on shots. So yeah, so I could have shot a head on, but only problem with the portraits or the tight frame is that we tend to look at the sharpness, the crisp, crispness, the eye contact. Like I agree, it is important, but why don't we try some different perspectives? Like just for an example, this tigress, she did walk head on, but I preferred making such images vertical frame, keeping the right hand corner of the frame empty and let the tiger enter the frame. So you can see the tiger is entering the frame from the left hand side, keeping the right hand side empty. That uh, you know that puts an impact on the image. It is a portrait. It is a tight frame, but a well composed, I would say. And then I'll show you this image. Even this is a portrait, but for me, this is just a normal shot of a tiger walking head on. So I would consider this as a flat image. Whereas, if we see this image, it has a different perspective. It has something new to it, something different to it. So shooting this is, of course, it's a tiger, so it has to look good. But why don't we try some different perspective? Why don't we try something different, which gives a new angle to the images, you know? Mm. And then comes this thing. Even this is a male tiger, which is walking head on. So again, the same thing head on. So this is where I thought, like, I can see the shadows and the sunlight, the shadows and the sunlight. This is actually late evening and the exposure, by the exposure and processing, I made it look as if it's like uh, early morning sunrise. Mm -hmm. So you can play with the light as well. If the tiger is walking head on towards you, 
it's up to you you can tiger is an easy subject it'll give you a lot of time so you can make some different images like this for me this is a well exposed images it is it has a creative uh, impact on it so just keep trying keep experimenting and now as you see this image and this image for me these two stand out compared to this one this is just a basic simple image for me which any photographer can make but if we are talking about this one playing with the exposure and this one playing with the composition so this is what matters this is what makes you stand out this is what uh, makes your perspective different from the others and this is what others are mm -hmm. this is what others see so, so you know uh, different perspective matters it will help yeah. We have a question on that. Uh, do you plan a shot beforehand or look for the opportunities right then and there on the spot? See, of course I plan a shot, but it is wildlife. Uh, you can't do anything if you don't get that image, right? Yeah. So that's what I said earlier, that your presence of mind and your perspective is what matters. First and foremost, don't panic. Secondly, choose the right equipment to shoot. And thirdly, <clears throat> Just, you know, create something in your mind then and there. Spontaneity is what matters in my life. Like two seconds, you have to decide something. If the opportunity mm. is gone, it's gone. Because yeah. the tiger is not going to come back to the same spot you want. So I, of course, plan shots. I, of course, have many images in my mind right now running in my mind. But it's not in our hand. You'll have to wait for the animal to come at that spot or animal to do such thing, whichever you want. Mm -hmm. But if you have the opportunity, we can make images. So yes, yeah. I plan shots, but spontaneity is what matters and uh, different perspective is uh, what matters. So then uh, moving on to this this image, even uh, uh, this is like just a, just a normal image. With uh, this, this tiger cub was uh, this tiger cub was uh, inside the bushes. He was sitting inside the bushes. So basically, what uh, what uh, normal photographers would do is uh, sit quietly, not shoot. But why not? Why not to try different perspective? Like in this, uh, the same case I showed you in the grassland I made. So again, here I made use of the foreground mm -hmm. because I did not have a good background. So I made use of the foreground, composed the tiger in such a way that it is walking into my frame. And if I would have shot this as a vertical image, my right and left hand corner would have been useless. You know, so yeah. make use of the whole frame. Even if the bottom of the frame, the second half of the frame looks empty, but it is my foreground which is adding up to the frame. So that's why, you know, yeah. spontaneity and creativity. This is where... It works. Wonderful. And see again, talking of creativity, uh, this image is of a reflection of a tigress uh, walking just above the lake. And again, I had many photographers around me. So what would make me different? It's just the perspective, the point of view. When the tigress was walking, everyone, uh, they switched on to the uh, wide angle lens, uh, the 7200s and all. And everyone is shooting the tigers walking with the reflection in the water. So I thought if everyone is shooting the same thing, what makes me different? What will make me different? What should I do? I just saw the reflection and shot the reflection of a tigers with uh, with the forest in the backdrop. So my this year made uh, was, uh, it's um, my first assumption was it was a short uh, you know slow shutter uh, image. Yeah. <laughs> So see that is what happens, Nisha. When you when you see something, uh, you should be spontaneous to act on it. Like right. this image made it to the BBC finals in uh, two thousand sixteen or seventeen, I suppose. Awesome. Yeah. So you know, this is these small things. They are right in front of you, but only thing is you need to see it that way. Even this thing, even this image. Uh, this image was awarded in France in the Creative Visions category in uh, 2014. So basically, the question the judges had 
is what is this image all about? And we know it's a reflection, but there has to be a hard ground or something where the cub is keeping it, uh, you know, the paw. How come the whole cub is reflected in the water and there is no hard ground? There is nothing where we can see the cub is standing. So basically this image was, the cub was walking on a log and the log was half underwater. I stood up on the top of the gypsy to get an angle where I could not see the log and I can just see the water and the reflection. So when I stood up and I saw through the viewfinder, even I was surprised. I was like, okay, wait, what is it? This looks something good. This is different. Because I had many photographers around me, so I had to try something different and I tried and it worked. So basically the thing is that unless and until you try, unless and until you make mistakes, you're not going to learn and it's not going to work. So the best thing in wildlife is learn from your mistakes, spoil your images until and unless you won't spoil your images, you won't learn from it. So again, this image uh, talking about uh, standing out of uh, standing out of the crowd, you know, as you can see why I'm saying standing out. So, uncountable number of people on that side. Same on my side. Even I was one of them. <laughs> I had to make something different. As you can see in the background, complete action shots. Okay, so the, these cups were playing for two, two and a half hours non-stop. Oh my God. In the background, if you can see, everyone shooting with a big lens. Even on my side, everyone shooting with a big lens. So I decided to shoot it with a 50mm lens. And this image got me through BBC photojournalism. This image got me through uh, a German, an award in Germany. This image got me through an award in China. And this image got me through some more publications. Publications mm -hmm. and recognitions as well. So, you know, the same thing again. Stand out, be different. And it's easy. We can do it. Only thing is we need to see. You know, whenever I used to take my eyes off the viewfinder, and I was like, oh my God, just look at the background. Look at the number of people. The tigers, it seems like they have nowhere to go. Okay, it is all open on the other side. But yeah, I had to make the image look like that. And intentionally, I have kept the, uh, you can see this, there's a third third tiger. The, tiger. Tiger, the left uh -huh. corner. Yeah. I have intentionally kept that. Just if someone says that you are disturbing the tigers and all that, I have a proof like, okay, see, there were four tigers. You can see the third one. He is sitting there calmly and there is nothing to be disturbed. These cubs were uh, used to the vehicles. But that's why they played for two hours there. So even this image, different thought, thought process. So that mattered and that helped. Yeah, so those were the tigers and tigers and a different perspective of photography and tigers from my point of view. So now uh, moving on to the series from Kenya. All those who have been to Kenya, like you guys, you of course know the place. And <clears throat> for those who have not been there, my suggestion would be whenever you go, carry as many wide angles as you can because the sky is magical. The light is magical. Very true. Yeah. So, only thing I I hardly use my 500 mm in Kenya. I think I use it for a day or two. That's it. I was shooting on 7200, 50 mm, 1116, 2470. That is it. That is a magical place and uh, one of the best skies you will ever see in the uh, in the world. So again, this is uh, Mara Masai Mara, Kenya. Early morning. The wildebeest, of course, uh, it was last September during the migrations. So these are the wildebeest running on the horizon with some cross uh, sunlights. Yeah. And yeah, so I think this image is here. Anyways, I'll talk about this. Uh, uh, this is a pair of a crossbill, a red crossbill. I made this image in Nepal, the eastern Himalayas. And in the backdrop, you can see is a Mount Everest. Okay. So even at this place, I had the 500 mm with me, but I preferred shooting on a 7200 only to get this different kind of perspective. But if I was mm. shooting on 500, the background was of course you know way too blur. So uh, 
this was in uh, uh, this was at a place called Sandakfu in uh, Nepal. So from where you can see the 360 degrees and uh, Mount Everest is also seen from there. So these are Red Crossville with a backdrop of the Great Mount Everest. And yeah, this is uh, one of my uh, wow. trademark images. <laughs> So even this image got me a few awards and uh, uh, pretty good recognition all around the world. And this is basically uh, from Bench uh, in central India. And this was peak summers, May. There is a leopard sitting on top right here. Wow. So, yeah, so uh, this is 11 mm shot. So again, the same thing, the different perspective standing out in photographers <clears throat> again. A bunch of photographers around me, 500 mm, 70, 200, each and every kind of lens they had. So again, think different, it works. And it worked. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know what happened? The presence of mind, the observation uh, around you. My guide was making a video of this leopard. And I saw something in his mobile phone and that catched my eye. That was the wide angle view. So... I thought that I had 11 mm in my bag. Why not to try? The leopard is just sitting. So I made this image and this was something special. I was like, okay, yes, it is catching my own eye. So it has to be something good. So that's why I uh, I stayed with a wide angle lens here and made this image. My so this basically shows a dry summer habitat of bench, the rocky terrain you can see there, and the tall trees. <clears throat> this, this image actually describes you what Pinch is. So that mm. is why this image stands out for me. And of course, a typical habitat of a leopard or uh, body language of a leopard after eating or, you know, just to rest, be on the safe side, will climb up onto the tree. And this is uh, from the eastern Himalaya. This is a very rare species called uh, the sand fox. I'm sure most of us. Uh, would have heard about it, but not seen or not photographed it. Mm. Not photographed yeah. it. So I saw this in North Sikkim. That is the only place in, uh, in India where you can uh, see this species. North Sikkim and on the uh, Tibet side, Tibet and China side, you can see uh, this, but in mm. India, only North Sikkim. So this was uh, me. That I made this image at 18,000 feet above sea level. Wow. And this is in the dry desert. I'll show you more images about that. Yeah, this one. So these are the wild ass. And you you would wonder like why did I post this image? Because this image is different because of the uh, difficulties while capturing these two, uh, the sand fox and the kiang. These are the kiang, the wild asses which are in Gujarat, LRK. They are different. Kiangs are different. They are found only in the Tibetan plateau, <coughs> sorry, or in the Himalayan regions. So I made this image at nearly 17,500 feet above sea level. And the area you can see the habitat, these are the cold deserts, the trans Himalayan cold deserts. So the temperature right here when I made this image was around minus 10 or minus 11 degrees, which you cannot imagine looking at the image. It looks like it is summer or something. Uh, yeah. Gujarat ka type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that is why that is why I wanted to show you guys this image. Like this is not what we think. This is completely different. This is seventeen thousand five hundred feet above sea level, minus ten degrees, and very close to China. And this is okay. Yeah, so these images which I'm showing are the wild animals in their habitat, not the African thing. So even this is a giraffe uh, from of course Masai Mara. And just look at the magical sky I was talking about, the Mara skies. So even here I used a wide angle. I think a 50 mm lens I used here. So be before going to this picture, <clears throat> we have a question. Uh, about the one uh, that sand fox and uh, the wild ass. What difficulty yeah. did you come across while shooting at such high altitudes? 
did you some uh, did you do something special to prepare for the shoot in snow oh, yes, yes yes i did i did i <laughs> i had plans to go here so uh, i lost quite a lot of weight i started running and walking here in nagpur because you know being a, a city boy with a city boy's lifestyle so it was impossible for me to go there because shooting out there in 18000 feet is not easy and more to add was the oxygen problem only 20% oxygen there so you had to carry your heavy equipment so you do not get porters out there and even if you shoot non stop for 10 seconds you'll start breathing heavily that could create some problems that could uh, create some serious problems for you so the only thing was you had to be physically and mentally fit to go out mm-hmm. here and shoot so i lost around 13 kg of it uh, to go here i started running i started walking for i did it for 3 to 4 months and that actually helped me here i stayed here for 4 days which is as good as impossible all those photographers who have been there they know what i am talking about so even the army uh, uh, army officers there there was a check post there was a camp where we had to report even they appreciated that it is commendable that you you were able to spend four days here and <laughs> carry such heavy cameras coming from city and especially a city like nagpur where like even if it's 10 degree celsius we start using the room heaters <laughs> yeah those people they knew about nagpur so even they appreciated like it's really commendable that people like you coming from central india and spending 4 days in the trans himalayas at such high altitude in such cold weather is not easy and carrying these equipment such camera 500 mm d4 air weighs around 5 and 1/2 kg so carrying such equipment and shooting in such difficult terrain were not not at all easy even you know i'll tell you about this sand fox you can see this image it's in a broad daylight mm-hmm. our shutter speed would have been easily around uh, 400 is so around 1600 or so but still i was i i but still i managed to shake a few images because of the cold the wind mm. it is so difficult so difficult to shoot you have to focus <clears throat> uh, you have to shoot on a wide aperture <clears throat> so yeah. because of you know the fumes if you can see in the image yes you do you see these fumes yeah they actually spoil your image they actually yes, spoil yes. your image. so it is very important for you to focus correctly and it is so windy so cold you you don't have time to set up your tripod or your bean bag mm-hmm. you just have to shoot handheld so if you see you can see the fur of this uh, sand fox uh, blowing away with the wind so you can imagine he has very small hair but still you know you can see uh, yeah. you can imagine how, how fast the wind would be what was the gears you were carrying i was carrying a d4s a 500 mm nikon yeah. and uh, a d500 and a 7200 with uh, a 1116 uh, tokina 1116 a 50 mm a 2470 and a converter oh my god uh, yeah. okay so i had i was keeping all this in my car but still when we had to shoot we had to carry it and that was yeah. oh my god horrible experience when, but when yeah. it comes to the camera uh, the equipment didn't had any issues right no not at all not at all i i thought i'll have uh, issues with the battery so i yeah. made a few pouches okay. uh, of uh, of a woolen jacket i i made a few pouches and i used to keep it in my underwear or inside my jacket just to keep it warm because yeah. uh, these are two three places which are the, which are <laughs> warm to you know. <laughs> yeah. so i tried everything but believe me d4s performed way much better than expected that's great i just had to recharge the battery twice i suppose because mm-hmm. we were shooting so much so we had to yeah. but uh, i did not use the second battery ever i did not mm-hmm. use it. it performed amazingly well we have one more question here me from uh, tanya about uh, how to overcome the certain inhibitions to create different images when shooting in low light the subject uh, is in the bush or uh, about prime lens and the options what do you make with the lenses and low light and when the subject is in bush 
Yeah, so first of all, if you want to shoot some good images in low light, your equipment matters. Of course, it does. Mm -hmm. Or the second option is try and make some creative images. Try and pan or do something if your uh, body does not support low light. So that is what the only option is, I suppose. If it's inside the bushes, it is, of course, difficult to focus in low lights. So even for that, you need good equipment. The latest equipment uh, are... Uh, equipment you know uh, good focusing technique good focusing systems yeah. so that that will help surely and of course so talking about prime lenses basically you cannot compare a telephoto and a prime to be frank there is a huge difference of course uh, prime has its advantages telephoto has its advantages both the things are way too different than each other yeah. so they both are not comparable <laughs> So moving ahead, this was again. This was uh, Africa. Okay, so this is the African series now. So this was basically a lion cup during an evening. So guys who have not been to Africa, let me tell you, uh, making such images is uh, quite easy in talking about Africa. But only thing is, you need that perspective, the light. You'll get the sky, you'll get such opportunities. Just, you just have to make use of it out there. And this is a cheetah during the sunrise. Again, talking about prospecting, most of the people I've seen is they'll place the cheetah's head right in between the sun. So what I did is I just gave it a try by shooting it in a different way, just to get the rim light effect on the cheetah and her sun in the background just to show, show the uh, sunrise. Mm -hmm. And again, this is Kenya Topi. This was uh, during the sunset, and it was covered with all the all the black clouds. It was going to rain heavily. Yeah. So this is a this is a rim light effect, uh, a huge nail line uh, on the morning. So basically, what I did is I exposed on the main the shining mane of the lion and underexposed of course I have processed this picture but yeah uh, just to, to tell everyone just to let everyone know about it how did I execute it yeah. so I I shot it on sp spot metering single point focus underexposing it by two three stops and yeah rest I uh, I processed it in Photoshop Lightroom and so this is uh, this needs a bit of practice, but everyone can do it. And this is again a topi. Uh, this is actually a merge of uh, two images. Okay. A topi and uh, a sunrise. Of course, uh, we know that this is not possible. <laughs> so both of them in focus. So yeah, this was just to get a different, uh, you know, a different feel to the image, something different. So this was just to present to you guys. That's it. And this was a cheetah with a kill. And these kind of images are not that difficult in Kenya, to be frank, I tell you. But uh, for me, uh, being a first timer, this was exciting. And again, uh, the rim light effect, uh, this time on a hyena. Yeah, so this one image from the Kenyan trip, the African trip, that makes my whole trip uh, worth for me is this image. This reached the finals of BBC 2019, but I was not able to submit the raw and tape file because I was getting married the same day I got the email. Size of my marriage was more important than BBC's. <laughs> 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 yeah, so. <clears throat> And even this image, I made it on uh, Tokina 1116 uh, D500. And uh, this was also 11 mm. And this gives the feel of, you know, that typical African habitat. You know, the roughness of Africa, the, the strong trees and the cheetah on it. So when the cheetah got onto the tree, if you can see, I'll show you, there were four cheetahs. See, this is one more. 
right here. Oh, oh. Yeah. Two of them were behind the tree. Uh -huh. So as the first Sita passed, I was I was just praying to God, like, okay, just climb, just climb up, just climb up. Because cheetahs, they don't usually climb up the trees, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just hoping for them, one of them uh, went up at last. So and this is when the rest of my friends with me, they were shooting on 400 mm, 70, 200. So that's what made me pick up the wide angle here. And it worked for me. Yeah, we, we have a question. Any special processing done here? Uh, yes. Uh, I processed it a lot, so I don't even remember what all I had done. But yes, uh, shadows and highlights, of course. And uh, then I think I used the gradient tool. I don't remember the exact settings what I used, but yes, I used the gradient tool to just to uh, control the exposure of the clouds because the clouds were uh, getting uh, overexposed and which was spoiling the fun of the whole image, the feel of the whole mm -hmm. image. And yes, I used the burn tool on uh, in the grasslands here, if you can see, yeah, to uh, yeah, just to get that uh, 3D effect, or or else this was looking like any ordinary mm -hmm. flat image, you know. Correct. Mm -hmm. So yes, I of course encourage processing. There is no harm in post processing, mm -hmm. and all the people who think that processing is bad, sir, it's not. Manipulation is bad. Processing is a need. <laughs> yeah. So and, post and what, oh, yeah. what time of the day this was shot? This was around uh, 12 p.m. I think. Oh, okay. 11.30 or 12. Yeah. Yeah, mid noon. Mid -no. 11.30 or 12 maybe. Okay. Yeah. So that is why I had to process it just to get yeah. uh, this a bit of dramatic effect in it. Yeah. And of course, see, post processing is an art. You cannot post-process a picture if you don't know how to post-process it. You cannot make a bad picture look good with your mm -hmm. post-processing skills. But of course, you can make a good picture look better with it. So right. post-processing, it helps. You should process it. And there is always a limit to do it. So uh, unless and until it makes your image uh, look uh, good or better, you should do it. Yeah. So this is one of the images uh, from uh, Kenya, Africa, that stands out for me. And of course, this one. Even this is uh, something unlike Mara, which usually people don't see or don't shoot, I suppose, because I have not <laughs> seen uh, many bird images from uh, Mara or Kenya. So this is a uh, southern ground hornbill feeding its uh, young one. So even this image was uh, pretty special for me. Yeah, most of the people only look for the cats, yeah. the animals. Yeah. Cats or the morning light or the evening light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, because of that, we, we miss out on such things. Yeah. And wow, you have been there. And even, you know, southern horn, horn, uh, sorry, southern ground hornbills, yeah. they are a pretty easy subject to shoot. And they are critically endangered. Yeah. So such if you images, spend some time, you will get amazing images. You will get images and yeah. they give you opportunities. They give you many Correct. opportunities. So that is what I did here. I tried to spend a few minutes, uh, half an hour or so with them. And yeah. it worked. It worked it. I, I think it's a pretty good, decent image for me. It is. <laughs> so now moving on to the Himalayas. Uh, I'll be starting from the Western Himalayas. This is, of course, the jewel of Western Himalayas, the Himalayan Mona. Yeah. So, again, unlike from the typical portraits of the Mona. So, I have tried to show you a, a common behavior of a Himalayan Mona, which, uh, which is observed there frequently. Like, they take their first flight during the sunlight, uh, sunrise. So, if you see the image, you can uh, see the blue feel of the mountains. All the mountains and uh, the edges of these mountains, these grass, they show you the first rays of the sun falling on them. And of course, the highlighted Monal. So yeah. that that shows you the sunrise and that gives you the feel, that morning feel of the Himalaya. Because you get this kind of a blue background uh, while you're shooting in the mountains. So this is what this image is all about. And yes, this shows a typical habitat of the Monal in the Western Himalaya. Uh, 
while uh, traveling to trekking to one of the uh, places called Chandrashila. There is a place where you see a lot of monarchs. Only thing is you need a good local guide there who will help you. So this is what kind of, this is the kind of images I had in my mind. Like I wanted to shoot a monal, of course, a portrait everyone wants because it is such a beautiful bird. But I wanted something different, like in its habitat. I wanted to see what the habitat is. And I wanted to portray that habitat. I wanted to show that habitat to the world. So this is what I made there. Then this is again a very, very rare image of uh, a pair of a spot belly eagle owl. It is very difficult to uh, find even a single owl. And I made these images in the, I think in the foothills of the Himalayas, of the Western Himalayas. Rarely you see pictures, even pictures of these. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is very difficult to find even a single bird. So you guys into are, are into birding, so you know the importance of Yeah. Birding. So beautiful. So it is very, very difficult to find this. So I got this beautiful picture of this pair. And then this is a snow partridge. Uh, he made this image in the Western Himalayas at 14,500 feet. Uh, even this is a uh, very less photographed bird. Quite less mm. photographers have uh, recorded this bird yet. And it is pretty easy to find. Only thing is you need to trek to 14,000 feet uh, up there. And how difficult it is to reach this place? <laughs> that's the only thing is that the only difficult thing in this. <laughs> <laughs> if if you reach up there safely, I'm sure you will be able to photograph this. <laughs> the only thing is you should be physically and mentally fit. That's the only thing. And this place, Chopta, uh, from Chopta, you will have to go to Chandrashila. It is a, a easy trek as compared mm. to the treks I've done. You have mm. a walking route out there. You get porters who will pick up your camera gears and everything. Oh. So only thing is you need to be physically fit to walk up for four or five thousand feet. Okay. It takes like three to four hours. Yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Getting down is difficult, in fact. Okay. Yeah. So this was How a snow park. How steep it is? The hike. It's not steep, uh, but uh, hike. Yeah, hike. It, it's difficult, and it's, it's very difficult getting down. And you know, you're getting down continuously for three hours, four hours, and you're still not uh, reaching <laughs> your destination. So it it plays with your mind a lot. So you have to be mentally fit. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so even uh, this was the image of full moon, uh, full moon day with a barn owl flying right in front of the moon. Oh my god! Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so this was pretty unexpected. Yeah. So this was just a matter of luck, you know, because I was seeing the bats flying around. I was just <laughs> trying to get a picture. Like once I get the bat in focus, then I'll take a picture of the moon and I'll merge it. But luckily, mm -hmm. I saw this barn all flying right in front of the moon. This was very far. So this is not a stacked image. This is one single image. Oh my right. god! Yeah. And we have a question: How difficult it is to shoot birds in flight, and what tips would you give? Uh, it's not that difficult, but yeah, shooting fast bird, uh, fast birds is difficult. Uh, I usually shoot in flight. You have, we have the uh, 3D matrix focusing in our camera that helps you focus. Or if it's a single word, I usually prefer using the single point focus. But the only thing is your body and lens should be fast enough to focus. Eh? If you're using a slow lens, so of course it's not going to be possible for you to focus. And practice is what makes you perfect. So shooting birds in flight or any action, it of course, is the practice or the practical knowledge uh, you. You need the, the practical knowledge, basically. And focusing, if you are talking about this images, this was pretty easy because the moon is way too far away and owl was too far away. So if you can see, the focus is still on the moon. The bird, mm. bird is slightly blurred, yeah. So you can imagine how far the bird would have been. Yeah. yeah. So that is why. So in this image, there was no problem about focusing because I just had to focus on the moon and wait for something to cross in front. And luckily, I got this out. 
Yeah, so even this image, this is, uh, you can see a creative perspective to the image. Early morning, very common site, Langurs, you will see it anywhere you go, all over India. So this is a very common uh, image. Only thing is, the thing I talk about, the perspective. So Underexpose it, see it from a different way. You, uh, even if with your naked eyes, we can see the rim light effect on the lungus while even while they are sitting. Mm -hmm. So, I shot what our naked eyes could not see, which our camera can. Underexpose it, play with it. They are just sitting, they are lungus. So, you can just experiment with it. Keep experimenting, keep playing with light, keep doing something different, and I'm sure you'll get something different. And this is how wildlife works. Yeah, this is one of the very, very close to my heart images, the red panda. <laughs> and I feel this is uh, what makes this image more rare is the red panda cubs. Yes, there yes. are very few, very less records in the whole world of wild red panda cubs. I had been told there with the locals I had traveled to, they were telling me that this might be the second or third photographic evidence of the red panda cubs in India. Like, I'm not sure. I don't know anything about it. That was my first trip. So they said the two photographic evidences with our naturalist here, and third one might be you. <laughs> I think I'm lucky. Yeah. So, so what, what is the reason crazy. for that? Red panda cubs are very shy. Okay. They don't usually come out. And secondly, very less people have photographed red panda. Okay. That cool. even that might be the reason, and of course mm -hmm. the cubs being shy, they don't uh, easily come out. They don't usually come out. That's why. Yeah. This was very late evening. This is a very high ISO image, mm -hmm. around I think uh, 6400 ISO image. But of course it was D4S, so it handled it pretty well. D4S and 500. Mm -hmm. So this is a very very close to my heart image. Such tiny panda cubs. It, are, <laughs> it is very very difficult uh, to see. And you know, even this time I was shivering because no one expected it. Such tiny <laughs> cup. We're expecting that even if we see uh, one or two panda, that is good enough. Mm. Yeah, so this image basically shows a typical habitat of a red panda in the eastern Himalayas. Sorry. Yeah. So this shows a typical habitat. It stays in the mountains, you can see the leaf, uh, the fruiting trees. You can see the small fruits on the trees here. Yes. So these are the fruiting trees on which the panda is feeding and he uses these branches uh, to move around on the trees. So this is a typical habitat of a red panda in the eastern Himalayas. And again, uh, this is a fruiting tree and this beautiful female red panda. So she was feeding. The cubs we saw uh, belongs to this female and we oh. were shooting the female. No one of us knew that the cubs are there. And while <laughs> we, wind, uh, we were winding up everything, suddenly someone saw and like, oh my god, these are the panda cubs. That was unbelievable moment. Again, this was one of the cubs, a cute little guy. <laughs> tiny, tiny panda cubs. These are like smaller than our domestic cats. <laughs> Even the forest officials, they were surprised. Even the forest officials were like, we, we have never seen them. We have just seen <laughs> them. So this is something new for them. And again, a red panda in the eastern Himalayas is popping its head out from the fruiting tree. Wow. So, you know, this, this image basically shows how easy it is to miss a red panda. Yeah. Even yeah. if it's right next to you. You can see how camouflaged it is. Even if it's right next to you on the tree, you won't be able to see. So this is how difficult it is to find them. So this is uh, again the eastern Himalayas. Of the trans Himalayas I told you about, the North Sikkim. So these are the Tibetan gazelles. And I've shared this image just to show you the conditions there. The cold deserts. And you can see the frozen view behind it. This was 12 p.m. Oh. Oh. This was around 12 p.m. So now you can just uh, imagine yeah. the, the temperature I was talking about, minus 10, minus 10, <laughs> and it was windy out there. 
So even this is uh, Eastern Himalaya, and this is uh, I think this is the last image I have. So this place is uh, basically called as a sleeping Buddha. You can see the shape of a sleeping Buddha. Yeah. Mount Kanchenjunga, <clears throat> and Mount Kanchenjunga is uh, highly worship worship up there in uh, Nepal and parts of West Bengal, the Himalayan region of West Bengal. So this is called as a sleeping Buddha because of the posture and the shape of the mountain. So this is me. <laughs> this is me photographing in the Himalayas. This is basically I wanted to show how cold it is there. So but it is it is possible for everyone to do it once we mentally decide it. You know, someone like me from Nagpur. From such a city can do it, so I'm sure anyone can do it. Only thing is, be mentally fit, be physically fit, and keep your goal in your mind that yes, you want to shoot, it. and it is easily achievable. Because I, I, I never imagined myself going to the Himalayas and shooting. Each year I go to the Himalayas for at least three or four times, or at least twice, minimum. So this is how addictive Himalaya is. It is a wonderful place, full of wildlife, unexplored, untouched, with virgin forest, virgin places. So I think everyone should should explore the Himalayas once at least. Amazing made this Param, actually. So I have a question from Race. Uh, I came late. Where was the spot bellied eagle owl shot? Spot bellied eagle owl was uh, Corbett. It was Dikala in the foothills of the Himalayas. Yeah. That was Dikala. And if, if you are shooting a new subject, do you read about it to get to know the species' behavior? Yes, I did. I did. Because uh, uh, being into wildlife from 13 years, we feel that nothing is new for us. But when I went to the Eastern Himalayas, when I went to the Eastern Himalayas that time, the Argali and everything, uh, that was very, very new for me. It mm -hmm. was very new for me. The Argali, Kiang, I never knew about it. I had to Google about the species. Like what is a gali? What is a kiang? What is a sand fox? That was pretty new. So, you know, there are quite a lot of things which I saw there, which were new for me, new for quite a lot of us. Like a gali, I was like, is it even in India? Is it even a species? I had to Google about it, and I was like, oh, is this is a gali? This is found in India. I was lucky enough to get some pictures of a gali, and hardly 300 of them are left in the wild. They are critically endangered. Yeah. Okay. So I was lucky enough to see two, two, three of them. And uh, another question we have is: uh, Which species, in your opinion, is the most camera shy and most camera friendly, which you have photographed? Camera shy. There are a lot of species which are camera shy. I can't name one, <laughs> but which I have photographed, I would say a porcupine. I, I have, I have photographed. Okay. Occupying, which is quite camera shy, and in fact, I was <laughs> scared of going close to it. So, which I have shot is porcupine. The rest, there are quite a lot of species that are camera shy, and camera friendly. I would say tigers. And tigers are one of the easiest subject to shoot. Mm -hmm. Only thing is, uh, if you give them time, if you give them space, make them comfortable, you uh, you'll get a lot of time. And tigers have pretty pretty easy to shoot they give, give you an ample of opportunities okay i think we have co covered almost all the questions in between only yeah and <laughs> raster all the messages about the How uh, amazing like images oh thank you thank you guys thank you so much <laughs> Thank you, Varun. Thank you so much for your time and the experience you shared with everyone. Amazing. Amazing experience. Thank you, thank you, Arnes. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely right. sharing the experience. I, I hope uh, people get to learn something out of it and just think out definitely. of the box. I'm sure, and definitely. Yeah. And, uh, we, yeah. it, it's such, you know, the perspective, seeing things to a different angle, the use of lens and the use of habitat, everything was so perfectly explained. That's amazing. Yeah. And most of the comments we uh, 
it came here are about the perspective of your images yes thank you i'll i'll surely go yeah. through it i'll surely read the comments yeah. and uh one more question before you leave do you use the screen of the camera at all or you always look through the viewfinder of course through the viewfinder but yeah the elephant image i showed you the 11 mm the elephant which was uh, right next to me yeah i had to use the viewfinder uh, the this thing uh, live view the screen i had the d500 so i had that tilt screen option because most of the time i was looking at the elephant because I, of course i was scared looking at that 15 20 feet giant right standing right in front of me so i could not afford to look through the viewfinder and of course there was a reason that i needed to get the low angle the and i mm. view perspective so yeah. i needed to get the low angle so i could not use the viewfinder i had to use the live view there and uh, uh, tilt the screen towards me up there and i was looking up in the screen from uh, like this and at the elephant at the same time so i think once or twice i have used the live uh, live view the rest of course we use the viewfinder sir so. wonderful in, in fact i yeah i think uh, do you have a vertical shot of this one at uh, that particular uh, series from what no i don't have a vertical no i i shot it uh, horizontally horizontally yeah cuz going vertical was a bit risky cuz if i were to move my hands god yeah. knows what <laughs> <laughs> that was way too risky going vertical there and and you may not be able to see because the tilt screen will not work vertically as well. it will not work yes absolutely tilt screen will not work and i cannot move in front of her yeah absolutely that's, that's, that's a huge risk that could have been risky yeah 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 so yeah. let's say wonderful image wow. of an indian elephant yeah, yeah. that too in the wild yeah <laughs> many many of uh, many of the uh, many of the photographers were asking like uh, where did you set up your camera trap when did you do this like this is not yes. camera trap that's that's <laughs> my question this as well i'm begin with <laughs> so this yeah. is handled the only thing is that you need to understand the behavior and make them comfortable yeah that's true so that is what worked here yeah yeah wait once again thank you so much thank you yeah, so much you. thank you ramesh for having me it was wonderful sharing my experience yeah thank you uh, can i see it? okay yeah. sorry no 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 it's fine all right yeah okay thank you thank all you right. so much thank you so much thank you so well, that was an amazing session <laughs> wonderful images that wonderful it literally take you to yeah. a different level of thought process yeah, yeah. and i definitely wanted to give him a personal request for the next edition of the magazine i didn't want to do it online <laughs> that's why i stopped it in between i understood and you want the indian elephant image <laughs> indian elephant image is yes i'm going to bug him on that uh, race uh, in fact we were talking about the one of the indian elephant image which varun takka has shot from corbett and you can if you rewind the session you will be able to see it as we did and we didn't want to bug him again yeah. to go back and forth you know um so the next is going to be again from india on uh, wednesday wednesday that's going Do to be my dr arun yeah dr arun yeah you can see some amazing uh, images from his side uh, yeah. a bit of camera trap and uh, a lot of bears so We, it's going to be definitely definitely a, another interesting session so looking forward for all your presence along with doctor and yes. uh, what else and yeah. yeah this the session is recorded uh, you can view in the in our youtube channel as well a as lot as of well. people want to view like i think a lot of people missed the first okay. part okay yeah and, uh, we can uh, it's uh, youtube.com/postraceofficial is the Uh, you are yeah. share it over here and then uh, uh um, is there a, yeah if you have if you have indian elephant images please do uh, share it because our next edition of the magazine is focusing on indian elephants 
Uh, and uh, how you can do this is you can go to postrates.co, register, click on login, click on contribute. You get a form there. You can submit the images. So the uh, uh, we will be our panel will be selecting a bunch of images to go along with the article. That's one thing. And the second thing is we have started a new initiative to make the planet more greener. So if you can plant any native sapling in your place and take a picture and send it across to us, to Ecoconnectors at gmail.com. Please do that. So we will be sharing it on our on, on my personal Instagram as well as we have a page dedicated for this in our website. And we, ha we have already created a page in the Instagram too. So we'll be sharing it all through throughout the platform along with uh, along with along with tagging you. So please do support us. It's a good cause. Uh, and simple thing which we can do to make this planet Earth beautiful. Yep. And that's all for the day. Yes. So, so hope see you on Wednesday. Wednesday, yes. Take With care. Bye-bye, everyone.